heavens the stars fall. From their courses, they fought against Cicero. The river kitchen swept them away. March on, my soul, be strong. Then thundered the horse's hooves. Look today. <laughs> wow, what a heavenly look today. <laughs> now, please greet one another. Good morning. Let us all hold up your Bible, please. Bible. Yes, let's go for another treasure hunt today as we take our shovels and dig into the word that God has stored for us. Amen? Amen. And our treasure location today is Judges chapter 5. So would you please turn your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 5. And we'll look at the entire chapter. Judges chapter 5. Imagine this, the Texas Rangers, after 63 long years, finally clinched their first ever World Series victory. It's a a big deal and coming together to celebrate. The parade through the entertainment district was definitely a sight to see. Leading the way are the Rangers players, their manager, and team ex- executives followed by bands from local schools and even members of the police and fire department. Everyone wants to be part of this action, participate, and it was reported that an estimated 400,000 to 700,000 fans from across the Dallas-Fort Worth region turned out for a parade to celebrate at the Texas Rangers' first World Series victory. Now, they won't be the case, unfortunately, in Washington, Oklahoma, (laughs) or New York, and in most all other communities, because the state of Texas had a victory. (laughs) And and just like uh, the story of celebration, today in our text in chapter 5, we witness the incredible victory song of Deborah, a prophetess and judge in Israel. In the previous chapter, we saw Israel oppressed by the cruel rule of Jabin. Then we studied together that Deborah arose, a light of hope chosen by God to lead his people. Please look at our text in chapter 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. So chapter 5 brings us to a moment of celebration as Deborah and Barak lift their voices in praise. Their song isn't just about winning a battle. It's about God's incredible power to rescue his people from the grip of their enemies. And guess what? Today we are invited to join in this celebration to sing out in gratitude for God's mighty works. But before we dive into the song itself, let's pause and reflect on the hardship endured by the Israelites under Jabin's rule. That's also part of the song. Please look at verses 6 to 7 with me. 6 to 7. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took the winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. So verses 6 to 7 here, we see the glimpse of the harsh reality of life when they were oppressed. Verse 6 implies that the highways were empty because people were scared to travel on them. They would take the secret path to, to stay safe, but even those weren't really safe. The whole community felt helpless, like there was nothing they could do. And verse 7 implies villagers were basically shut down and life was anything but normal. War was always looming over them. Then look at the bottom of verse 8. It says, but not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Imagine facing an army like 
that with no weapons, no shields, nothing, they have a 900 chariot armies. It's no wonder everyone was, was scared. Fear was everywhere. And to make things worse, there was no strong male leadership to guide them. When the enemy came knocking, there was nobody stepping up to lead the fight. But in the midst of this chaos in Israel, God chose Deborah to be a leader. Look at verse 7 again. It says, they held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose, a mother in Israel. She wasn't just any woman. She was strong in her faith, trusting God completely. Deborah didn't just sit around while her people suffered. As a prophetess and judge, she had a direct line to God's voice. And when God called her to lead Israel to victory, she didn't hesitate. Fear didn't paralyze her. Then now Barak enters the scene, and we all know what happened from our previous study. Despite God's call through Deborah, what does he do initially? He hesitated, right? Struggled with faithless fear. That was the key word. He said, I will go with you if you come with me. Barak was dealing with some serious doubt and fear. But Deborah, not a soldier herself, didn't let her fear boss her around. Her faith was solid. Barak asked for her to come along and she went showing full trust in God's plan and standing by Barak's side despite his shaky faith. And then something incredible happened in the battlefield. After 20 long years of oppression, suddenly their bonds were broken and Israel was free again. It was a moment of freedom, a moment that filled their hearts with gratitude and praise. And that's why they sang the victory song we read about in Judges 5. Look at verses 2 to 3 with me. When the princes or the leaders in Israel take the land, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise to the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. And these verses really show the importance of singing and praising God's amazing works in our lives as a constant reality. It's not just a one-time thing. It's something we should be doing continually. Amen? And this wasn't the first time the Israelites sang a song of praise to the Lord. Back in the days of Moses, during the Exodus, they sang a similar song after God parted the Red Sea, saving them from Pharaoh's enemies. In Exodus chapter 15, it says, The Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has heard into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, I will exalt him. From the Exodus, they acknowledged and praised for God's strength, defense, and salvation. And even at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, we see a vision of heavenly saints and angelic choirs singing praises to the Lord, the Lamb who was slain. In Revelation 5.12, it says, In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. This is really showing us that singing praise to God is an eternal act of worship that will never stop. And even right in the middle of the Bible in the book of Psalms, there are 150 chapters filled with songs. So singing to God is central to Christianity. And that's why we want to thank our incredible music director, Lisa, and those Pam, Barbara, and all the choir members, the Sunrisers, for constantly leading us in this praise. Let's give, give them a big hand of applause this time. Yeah. <laughs> so just think about it. We often celebrate personal achievements, right? 
like getting a job promotion, completing an educational milestones, graduation. We celebrate building projects or even major life events like birthdays, marriages, and anniversaries. These special moments hold meaning to us, reflecting our human accomplishments. But amidst all these celebrations, the question is this. Do we give enough attention to celebrating God's life-changing victories in our lives? Do we give enough time and attention to that? Our lives are filled with moments where God's hand is at work. Think about the times when you've experienced God's intervention. Whether it was guidance in a difficult situation, decision and comfort in times of distress, or the restoration from brokenness. These instances are not mere coincidences, but reflections of God's active involvement in our lives. From the small, intricate details of daily life to the profound, life-altering events, there's evidence of God's miraculous works. But it is very important to identify these moments. And when we identify these special events, they should not simply be markers on our individual timelines. They should be elevated to occasions of collective praise and worship within our church community. Will you say amen? So when we come to this place on Sundays, there's a deep need for us to come together and realize the life-changing victories orchestrated by God. And exactly our worship should reflect this recognition and gratitude and praise. We should lift our voices in sincere praises to the Lord. And we sing, sing a lot of beautiful hymn, hymnals today, acknowledging His goodness and faithfulness. And our gratitude should extend to our acts of giving to God as well through offerings and tithes. Those are also acts of praise. Now, I don't ask about the needs of offerings and giving as much to you because I'm a firm believer that when I passionately and faithfully present God of the Bible to you, it should naturally lead you to respond with generosity to him. Because I believe that when I dedicate my entire time, energy, and passionate preaching and present the beauty of God laid out in scriptures, that itself should stir up in your heart immense gratitude, motivating you to give back to him from the abundance he has provided. So this is the first point of the message. The first point is we should take time to notice and celebrate the amazing things God does in our lives and in our church by singing, praising, and giving back to God in humble offerings. We can express our thanks for all the good he has done for us. Will you say amen? Amen. Second point is God is our mighty warrior who fights our battles. We have a God who fights our battles for us. And this depiction of God as a warrior is not new to us. And even in the past, as we were growing up, we sang hymns like Onward, Christian Soldiers, recognizing the spiritual battles we face and our need for God's strength. But our understanding of God has evolved over time. We are not using this term as often because we are not advocating for violence in the name of religion, but call to pursue peace and reconciliation, things like that. So it feels like this description of God as warrior has been lost over time. But when we say God is a warrior and fighting our battles, we're not saying our battles are simply physical battles, but they are often internal and spiritual battles, right? That's why Paul said in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We wrestle with doubts, fears, and challenges every day. And in those moments, God doesn't come charging in with swords drawn. No, he fights for us with his truth, his love, his compassion, and his righteousness. So while we are familiar with comforting images of God as a good shepherd or a good father, 
and other such depictions, the portrayal of God as a warrior has somewhat faded from our collective understanding. But why is it important that we don't shy away from this concept of having a God who fights for us? The reason is because there are battles, many battles in our own lives that we in our human capacity cannot win. We need a God who fights for us because we cannot win this battle on our own. And when we make the choice to follow Jesus, we enter a battlefield. The Christian life unfolds in a world increasingly hostile to the gospel. And behind the opposition, there are spiritual forces that surface our ability to contend with. In the face of such battles, our personal efforts fall short. The adversary we face is too strong for us to conquer independently. If victory is to be attained, it must come through God's intervention and as he wins the battle for us and grants us the victory. That's exactly why we need God as a warrior who can fight our battles for us. And how did God fight for the Israelites? Our text today gives us more detail about what exactly happened that was not given in the previous chapter. Look at verses 20 to 22, verses 20 to 22. It says, from the heavens, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away, the age-old river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul, be strong. Then thunder the horse's hooves, galloping, galloping, go his mighty steeds. We know from our last study, Sisera, the, com- the enemy commander, is in Harosheth Hagoim. And Barak and his armies are in Mount Tabor. So picture this. Sisera, a strategic military leader, forms an alliance of Canaanite kings, rallying their forces, including an imposing fleet of 900 chariots. Their destination is the plains of Jezreel, where a clash with the Israelite army led by Barak is inevitable. So the stage is set for an epic showdown. Caesar's forces, confident in their superior numbers and military hardware, anticipate a swift and decisive victory. Yet they didn't know that God was involved in this battle. Suddenly the dark clouds gather ominously on the horizon, signaling the approach of a storm of unprecedented magnitude. This wasn't just a natural phenomenon. It was a manifestation of God's divine intervention. With astonishing precision, the storm swept across the land, gathering momentum as it journeyed toward the battlefield. Just as Barak and his men were preparing to engage the enemy, the heavens opened, unleashing torrents of rain that caused the Kishon River to swell and overflow its banks. Each raindrop became a weapon, transforming the terrain into a mix of mud and chaos, making the battlefield virtually impenetrable for Caesar's chariots. And they were all swept away by the current and drowned. And we studied last Sunday that no chariot army survived from this. Only Caesar, the commander army, survived and fled to Giles' tent only to be put to death by our own hands. And guess what? Just as God fought for his people in ancient times, so too he can fight for us today. Do you believe that? So take heart in knowledge that the God who moved heaven and earth to save his people is the same God who walks with you through every trial and every tribulation you face. What can you learn from today's God's word? The Song of Deborah teaches us an important lesson of celebrate the amazing things God does in our lives by singing, praising, giving back to God in humble offerings. Secondly, we have God as our mighty warrior who fights our battles. And thirdly and lastly, we are called to active participation in life's battles. It teaches us the importance of participating 
in the battle. Now, God did miraculously intervene in the battle for Israel, but the Israelites still had to make the move and go to the battlefield. This is why in our last study in chapter 4, verse 6, God spoke through Deborah to Barak these words, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. But what did Barak say? If you go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I will not go. So Deborah promises to go with him. And when they are near the battlefield in chapter 4, verse 14, Deborah says again, Arise, go, Barak. This is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. The Lord has gone out before you. And because Barak proceeded with Deborah's command, that's how he and his armies were able to witness the miraculous intervention of God. Of course, the battle belongs to the Lord, but they still needed to participate in the battle. That's the important point. Now, in chapter 5 of our text today, it tells us an extra detail that there were some tribes of Israel who joined in this battle. Please look at verses 13 to 15 with me, 13 to 15. It says, the remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Machil, captains came down. From Zebulun, who, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley. So these verses talk about six tribes being united in sending volunteers into the battlefield. From the tribes of Ephraim, Benjamin, to Machil. Machil meaning the half-tribe of Manasseh, living west of the Jordan. And from Zebulun and Issachar, and later it also talks about Naphtali. These six courageous tribes stepped forward, and they were moved by the Holy Spirit to rally to the side of Deborah and Barak, ready to confront Sisera and his allies head on. But in the midst of this inspiring display of courage, the next verses shed light on a sobering contrast. Let us turn our attention to verse 16, because these verses tell us there were four tribes who have not volunteered. Please look at verse 16. It says, Why did you stay among the sheep pens to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Across the Jordan, the, the tribe of Reuben engages in endless committee meetings, discussions, and great resolves, but their actions amount to nothing. Their desire was to remain undisturbed, to cling to the peace of their roller setting, whistling the shepherd's pipe rather than the war trumpet. That's what it says, whistling of the shepherd's pipe. The prospect of supporting the initiative against Sisera appears frightening, too costly to entertain. So we have to think about this. How often the church of our day reacts in exactly the same way? How often do we offer empty words? There's many searching in the heart, it says. Endless discussions, well-intentioned sentiments, only to retreat when the call for action arises. How often do we echo the sentiment? We sang this hymn, but how we, often do we echo the sentiment? Here I am, I am, Lord, send someone else. <laughs> then look at verse 17. Verse 17. It says, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And then why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. We see that the tribe of Manasseh to the east finds itself situated safely on the opposite banks of the Jordan River. So they don't want to participate. They're safe already. Meanwhile, tribes of Dan and Asher are instead in the relentless pursuit of worldly pursuits. Their lives consumed by the demands of trade and commerce by the ships. 
justifying their absence from the battlefield with the pressures of livelihood obligations. They succumb to the allure of self-interest, a temptation all too familiar in contemporary churches. And this is the problem that churches are facing today. Despite the important role of prayer as the arena where our faith contends with the forces of darkness, and although our active participation in the church events, projects are important, the vision of the pastors is very important, we often find ourselves not willing to participate, entangled in trivial distractions, prioritizing worldly pursuits over the weightier matters of faith. Our modern churches are becoming more and more characterized by a prevailing sense of spectatorship. Now, today we've grown accustomed to watching, whether it's from the comfort of our couches before the TV set, watching a football game, or even watching the worship service online. And please don't understand me, don't misunderstand me. Media ministry is immensely important. That's why we, we are working our heart to to set it up, to reach out to the homebound, and leading many others to Christ. But I'm speaking in general trends that we see in churches today. Despite being physically able to attend the church service in person, we find ourselves in the role of spectators. From the comfort of our spectator seats, we observe life's unfolding drama, content to offer commentary, and analysis without truly stepping onto the battlefield. But is this truly what God desires of us? Does he not call us to gather together in worship, to actively engage in the life of the church? The essence of true worship lies not in mere observation, but in our collective participation as one body of Jesus Christ. Amen? It is in coming together amidst conflicts, trials, and the complexities of human relationships. Of course, the brothers and sisters in Christ, we have this human relationship. Of course, it's a human gathering. There will be conflicts. But through that process, we are being built together as the church of God. That's what God wants us to see. As we, as we resolve the conflicts, as we work together, pray together, wrestle with it, We are shaping together the chipping away of the stones. Feed it together in the church of God. And that brings full glory and joy to God's heart, our Heavenly Father. So God demands us together for worship. Within the body of Christ, there's an urgent need to revive the spirit of courage and determination demonstrated by figures like Caleb. And Caleb said this when he was 85 years old. He said, I am still as strong today as I was on the day Moses sent me as one of the ten spies. Right? And we have a person like Curtis who's, who's older than Caleb. Right? He always participated in the early service. It's not easy to do early service, second service, both services. We have Mr. Preston Cox who is in his mid-90s, right? I saw him mowing the church lawn the other day (laughs) and immediately thought about it as I was preparing the message. It's a beautiful picture of dedication, commitment to serving God's house. And I think many members of this congregation, this church, who, who are committed and dedicating themselves to the work of the church and it brings immense joy. to them. They know that it brings joy to their hearts. So they do it. And I want to challenge the younger members of our congregation too. We really have to step up. And to all of us, we need to continue to show our younger generations the depth of our commitment to God, not just in words, but in our actions and deeds as well. And this is something that we may not take lightly because God himself rebukes those people who did not participate. Please look at verse 23 with me. Verse 23. It says, curse Merods, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its people bitterly because, why? They did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. 
Meroz is a name of a town. So imagine a town positioned strategically with a chance to aid Barak in the pursuit of victory. There was their chance to do it, but they chose to sit on the sidelines. And so God curses them. So we have to really ask this question. How often do we, like Meroz, find ourselves standing on the sidelines, hesitant to engage in God's work? How often do we prioritize comfort over conviction, complacency over courage? Here it is the darkest verse in the whole song of Deborah in chapter 5 because it shows us that in certain circumstances, doing nothing can be the worst of all sins. But in great contrast, look at who is being praised and blessed in verse 24, Jael. Look at verse 24 and 27. Most blessed of woman be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed of ten dwelling woman. Then verse 27. At her feet, Sisera, he sank, he fell, there he lay. At her feet, he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. When God's own people of the Israelites did not come to help, Jael entered the sin. We studied that together. We saw that she wasn't even an Israelite. She came from a different group called the Kenites. But when the opportunity arose to do something brave for God, she didn't hesitate. She took matters into her own hands and boldly faced the enemy commander Sisera. And for that reason, the peace prevailed. And for that reason, her action is praised and blessed in the climax of the Song of Deborah here. So what's the takeaway here? It's crystal clear. If you want to experience God's blessings, we need to be active participants in the battles he places in our lives. And I want us to take a moment to reflect on the incredible blessings we've received as a result of our active participation in the battle for righteousness, battle for the truth. We personally experienced this together. And you know what that is? Just think about that. Back in May 2022, the Global Methodist Church was born. It has been less than two years, but look at what God has done now. We've seen over 4,000 churches and more than 700 congregations waiting to join us this year. That's not all. Over 4,000 clergy members have aligned with GMC, with over 800 more waiting to join this year. Isn't it truly amazing? This is all testament to God's mighty hand at work. Less than two years, he saw us struggling over the many, many years, 50, 100 years, like a dying tree with compromised beliefs. The identity of Jesus Christ as the eternal God was compromised. His literal death and resurrection was compromised. And the scripture His own word was reduced to simple human language. We were like a burning stick on a fire. But God, we don't deserve this grace, but God had a compassion on this burning stick and snatched us out of the fire and called us as the global Methodist church. And God had a mercy and compassion on us within less than just two years to be the movement where we can bring restoration and renewal in the hearts of the Methodist church. God has not abandoned the Methodist church. This is clearly the hand of God working among us. This is the perfect example of God fighting our battles for us. Amen? And guess what? We were not just passive spectators in this journey. No, we stepped out of our comfort zone. We were right there in the front line with Deborah and Barak. We were fighting alongside God. And look at the blessings he has poured out on us. Sure, there were doubts and fears along the way, especially about our finances and state of our church. But look at where we are now. We've emerged stronger than ever. And in less than two years, he has lifted us up as an example among the global Methodist church. 
And we have to know that there are still many churches who are behind and struggling even more because they didn't, did not choose to participate in the beginning. We have to pray for that. So, you know, every time I go to the conference, they talk about our church. They give us two thumbs up. Comanche, two thumbs up. <laughs> of course, it's very humbling. But here's the thing. We can't just dwell on our past achievements. We have to keep going. We must stay active in our spiritual battles this year as well. Committed to praying for our church. Praying for our brothers and sisters. This is your family. And for this new movement and for one another and dedicating to study God's word. So as we come to the conclusion of our time together, we want to remind ourselves these three lessons that the Holy Spirit conveyed to us this morning from the Song of Deborah. It teaches that the importance of celebrating an amazing things God does in our lives. Secondly, God, we taught us that God is our mighty warrior who fights our battles. Just as God fought the Israelites against their enemies, he continues to fight for us today. And finally, we've been reminded of the importance of active participation in God's work. Just as Deborah, Barak, and some tribes of Israel joined together to confront their enemies, so too we must engage wholeheartedly in the battles God sets before us. Let's not be like the inactive tribes and the town of Merods, standing on the sidelines, being rebuked by, the God, by God. But rather, let's be like Jael, boldly stepping forward in faith and obedience. So as you leave this place today, may we go forth with courage, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord, that he will lead us to the victory. Therefore, there is no reason that we don't have to participate in this battle. Because the battle belongs to the Lord, we can courageously participate in this battle together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And that all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray together. Let's quickly pray for these three lessons points that the Holy Spirit taught us here, the, the, the first thing, just remind yourself, am I giving enough attention, enough time of praising God for what he has done all through my life? He has been faithful and good to us. Secondly, do you believe that he is the mighty warrior who's moving and trembling the mountain, trembling the heaven and the earth to save us? And thirdly, are you just going to be the spectators? Or are you going to actively participate in the matters of the church? Especially when pastor asks for visions or something that we need to do. We have to encourage one another to do that. Participate in the church activities, events for the kingdom work of God. So let's pray at this time. The Lord, use me. Here I am. Please send me. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this message. We are so marvel at your word, Lord. We praise you for all the things that you have done. May the praise and the songs never cease. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for having us that witness of your victory of the mighty battle that you have done through the Global Methodist Church within the last than two years. Lord, we thank you that you have moved our hearts to be that active participant in the front line. And look where we are now. We're so blessed to have this church family together, to have our worship reoriented and have the scripture being proclaimed, the authority held up high. 
Lord, we thank you for the wonderful blessings that you have poured out on us. We pray for this movement. And may we actively continue to participate in your battle and receive the blessings that you have in store for us, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.